behold and watch happen. And I've tried it myself, and it's uh, on a scale of one to ten, it's twenty. <laughs> But we're here to actually find out some information from John. John, uh, I've always wondered about the colors in glass, what they're derived from. Could you uh, explain this a little bit for the people? Most glass starts out as crystal. From the crystal, chemicals are added to either opacify it, which would turn it into a milk glass, or to color it, and it could be colored either clear or opacified, transparent or opacified. Most of the colorants that are used are heavy metals. We use cobalt oxide, copper oxide, cadmium sulfide, silver nitrate, and manganese. A whole spectrum of, of colors can be derived from these chemicals. This particular piece is a, is a gold ruby. The manganese will give you a purplish color, the cadmium a yellow or an orange. The cobalt, the blue that is a Noxema blue type. Do, do you still, uh, I know that you used to mix all of your own colors. Do you still mix all of your colors? No, most of the colors I buy now from a, a company, well, they're made in West Germany. I buy them either out of California or North Carolina. And I found that they provide a lot larger palette of color, a lot of wider spectrum color than what I can mix myself and allow me to, to vary the, the patterns and the, just the mixture of color. My background is in watercolor and my, my interests are, it is in color. Well, that explains why that your glass is so much different than other people's. It really looks like you paint your glass versus... Exactly. I, I'm painting on a three-dimensional surface. However, I'm painting with glass, on glass. I'm not, they're not painted on the surface in the sense of being a paint, a watercolor, or an oil-based paint, or anything like that. They are colored glasses which are fused in during the blowing process. Do you have any s specific shapes or sizes of uh, your work that you prefer to do? I notice that the variety is, uh, you know, you've got large and small and wide and fat and short and tall. Is there or you just that's, that's life. That's it. That's <laughs> life. Large and small and short and, and tall. <laughs> um, the forms that I use are, are primarily simple forms. I like a clean, simple form because I'm using the form as a vehicle for the painting. I see. In the same way that a painter uses a canvas as a vehicle for the painting. And so I try to keep this, the forms relatively simple and straightforward. You've been working glass for, what, since 1969, if I remember? Uh, yeah, I, I first blew glass in 69. I've been in it actively since 71. And you, you, you derive your total income off of your work also, don't you? Yeah, and have for about nine years now. What, what can you tell me about your tools? I've noticed that the furnaces and the, the bench which that you've made yourself, which is absolutely, it's a piece of art in itself. Are these, are these designs or things that you've enhanced on, or...? There's been very little change in the, in the design of the tools. There's been a lot, of, a lot of updating as far as materials, and of course now with furnaces and, and that sort of thing, we're using a lot of, a lot of uh, materials that were a result of NASA and a lot of space age technology. But primarily the hand tools have remained unchanged for centuries. Uh, a lot of the wooden, mostly they're wooden and metal tools. I use cherry primarily. There's a good deal of wild cherry that grows in the area, and I use a lot of it for the wooden tools. And then the metal tools are, are manufactured. Some I make myself, some I order from West Virginia or England or Germany or wherever that specific tool is available. There's a, a lot of personal preference in tools. There's certain tools that I'll use that another glass blower would find very inconvenient or not at all satisfying to his touch. And with glass, tools are very important because you can't touch it during the process because of the excessive temperatures. And therefore, the tools need to become an extension of, of your hand. You need to feel the glass under the tool using your tool as your fingertips so that you can judge 
you know, how the glass is moving. You can't touch it, you can't set it on a shelf like you can with pottery, say, and, and go back to it and look at it. You can't stand back from it and look at it for 10 hours in the case of a painting or, you know, that sort of thing and, and make further judgments on it before you complete the piece. You have to sit down and do it all at once and without handling it, physically handling it with your hands, so all the tools that you use have to become an extension of your hands. As an admirer of your work, I'm, I'm just, your new work is just, it's stunning. Are you really, are you pleased with it? Are you with the direction that it's going now? Yeah, I'm real pleased with the direction it's headed. I, I think, again, it's like, like any other time, it has a, has a, a long way to go before I reach the final idea that I'm striving for, maybe, the final development, but I'm real happy with the stage it's at, and I think that, that uh, my feeling about glass or any other medium is you can talk about it all you want, but if it doesn't stand on its own, it's not worth talking about. And so I, I try not to justify my work verbally. I, I, make it and put it out and hope it justifies itself, it justifies its own existence. That it does. There's no doubt of that. Do you draw from the environment? Does that, the particular environment that you live in or anything, does that influence you? Not consciously. I think that certainly it has an effect. Uh, if I'm in an environment or in a state of mind where I'm not happy, then my work, I think, reflects that. If I'm in an environment like where we are now, we're real happy. We like the area, we like the, the people here, we like the climate, I like my shop, and that's one reason I put the time into the equipment that I do. Um, we enjoy being here, and I think that, that my work is reflecting that. I think that the work is, is happy, too. There's quite a, quite a large uh, contemporary art movement, movement in this country concerning glasses, and it's become very active in the last few years. Uh, it's all relative, I think. Is it? Um, there's, there's a lot more people doing it now, say, than 10 years ago. But on the other hand, there still aren't very many people doing it. I would say that actively making a living, now there's a lot of people that are associated with universities and things like that, but I think as a sole source of income um, on a you know, full-time basis, glass blowers, there's probably only several hundred in the country. For one reason, there aren't a lot of people that do it, because because of the, the amount of effort that's involved, but also the, the length of time it takes to, to learn how to do it. You know, you tried it. Yep. You know how easy it looks to do. Oh, yeah. And how hard it is, it is to complete. duplicate. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it usually takes a couple, at least a couple of years of intensive work to, to gain any kind of proficiency with glass because it's unlike anything anybody does. And at some time during the process of forming or completing a piece of, of art in almost any other media, you're able to touch it. You're able to sit it on a shelf and come back to it later and look at it again. Uh, make judgments on it. With glass, you can't do that. For the most part, it's a one-shot operation. You've done your teaching uh, uh, experience uh, already. Yeah, I've, I've been through the mill. <laughs> been ground up and chewed up. Yeah. yeah. I enjoyed teaching, but I decided that my own work was more important. My own state of mind was more important. Okay. With your, with your background in uh, drawing and painting and uh, undergrad and grad work, why did you choose glass? Uh, why have you branched off into glass? I can't sing and I can't dance. That's a good answer. It's hard to be. <laughs> That's all, folks. <laughs>